Caitlin Holland is going to give us a presentation. He's a past president of this chapter. I know he's been busy the last couple of years. We haven't seen him. But he is. Okay, I'm not projecting. Anyway, we got that ex Air Force, flew C 130s, was what an instructor. Yep. Down there in Antarctica, yep. landed a bee down there. Yep. Uh -huh. so he's now a court of Skagit commissioner, and he's going to give us a briefing on um, everything, all the issues that he's learned that he has to deal with. You know, coming up with plans and what is involved in implementing. He, he touched on this uh, a couple of meetings or two ago, but it was a lot more complicated than I ever imagined. Yeah. You know, I guess I'd always had dreams that someday we turn that closed taxiway into a mecca for general aviation where we can all hang out. Well, there's, there's some pretty good reasons. It's not quite as tough. Well, okay. Um, but anyway, take it away, Mary. Okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for, for inviting me to come and do this. I know it's not all aviation oriented because I have to, in order to, to help improve your knowledge of uh, the way the port operates, um, the only way I can do that is to kind of give you a lot of facets and that is because we have a marina, we have a business district, we just bought a new uh, 120 acres out here in the watershed business district and uh, those things all play into how we spend our money. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a, a Boeing guy, and so, you know, a 737 costs about $160 million, you know, that's one airplane. And uh, so when you, you know, if we touch anything at Boeing, it costs $250,000, 300000 It just doesn't matter, right? So the numbers are just a lot, uh, a lot bigger. And when you come to the port, it's not like that. Uh, you know, we, we could run the port for 10 years on one 737. So that's how, that's how uh, we don't have the same capital. And so uh, as you try to wrap your head around that with me, hopefully you'll come away from this little presentation a little bit uh, more knowledgeable about what the commissioners and the staff struggle with in order to bring the, the type of airport that we have here available. And so just from that, I'll give you the capital budget summary. This is online. You can find this. This was put out in November that we've voted on. And uh, to give you an idea, um, so the SWIFT Center, which is the Cedar Woolley uh, uh, Technology Center, um, we're going to spend 375000 out there and we're going to do nothing. It's going to cost us $375,000 just to maintain the property, just so you know what kind of numbers we're talking about. Conway is a piece of property we have south here. We're going to spend 550000 on that. Because there was a wood company down there and they've leaked oil and different things into the ground and we have to clean it up. And we tried to sell it. We had an interested customer, but then the thing kind of fell apart because of the way the economy is headed right now. And so they've decided to sit still for a little while. But we were going to sell that and get rid of it. Uh, but now, since we're not going to sell it, we only have so many years before we have to institute cleanup. And so we have to go down there and spend some money to clean that up. So you're almost at a million dollars and we've done nothing. <laughs> you know, and that's, it's interesting. And when you look at our total income stream, that's a lot of money to the poor. It really is. So it's about 875,000. Okay. So then the airport, we're going to spend 12 million this year, 800,000. Okay. Just so you know what that what that looks like. The Bayview Business Park, which is the businesses that we have out here that you see, we're going to spend 1.3 million on that. The marina, we're going to spend 1.5 million on that. We propose to spend 30 million dollars on a state-run program to bring fiber optics to all of the outer lying communities, right? And so let me, let me caution you with some of these numbers. We don't make that kind of money. <laughs> we just don't. So how does it work? Well, some of it comes in. We have a very low tax. You, you, you see it in your taxes. If you go look, you know, most people that have a $400,000 house, you probably gave us 150 bucks or so to the port. That's, what, that's what's in your taxes for property. And uh, so when we, when we get all of our money collected, we don't have anywhere close to these money. So how do we get it? There's three entities that we go to. We go to the county, we go to the state, and we go to the federal government. That's how we get these grants. So these numbers that I'm giving you are not necessarily real. The Swift Center and the Conway are real. We're going to have to take that out of hide and budget because there's no grants for that, right? So anyway, but other than that, we go to the state, we get grants, which is just tax money that's collected in a different form, or we go to the county, we get a grant, or we go to the Federal Aviation Administration. We're going to do a $10.4 million restructuring of the, of the pavement out here because it's too thin, and so, uh, but 90% of that money came from the FAA, and the, some of it comes from the county for curb funds, and then the rest of it gets made up by the port, which is a small amount 
out compared to the 10.4 million that actually goes into it. And uh, some sometimes, uh, at least as a, a person who never had any experience with this, you just kind of wonder sometimes how does the money work and, and how it goes. And that's what I'm trying to give you here is a sense of what our staff does. Now, the commissioners, we don't do that. The staff does that. So there's 35 employees here. Um, and I asked Sarah a month ago, I said, Sarah, do you have enough people? Because when I look at the complexities of what's going on around here, there's a lot that you have to do. Um, uh, in order to get this money, you have to meet grant dates. So there's certain dates in the system where the port employees have to put together all of the details. You don't get a grant by just saying, I need $400,000. That's not the way it works. You go, I, I want $400,000, and here's where I'm going to do it. And then you have to realize, too, that there's all these instances of restrictions in order to get that $400,000. And that's and so we'll, we'll get into that a little bit deeper as we go along here. So, but then the port has to meet all those criteria, and then we submit it to a, to a commission, and the commission decides whether we get the money or not. And that's just how it works. And so, and they can say yes, or they can say no. And one of my uh, 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 criticisms on Tuesday in a public meeting is, is that the, the port provides all these jobs, we have all these different things, but we don't see the money like this, because when a guy making 100000 goes out and buys a house, whatever, that money goes to the county, goes to the state when he's buying fuel, we don't get that. We only get the least property that we have, and there's not a lot of, a lot of uh, there's profit in leasing, but not as much as what there is in buying fuel and different things where these taxes are. So the port does not directly receive that. So we do our job, we provide jobs, and we provide these instances, but the state and the county get most of that lion's share of that money, and so we have to go ask for it back. And that's why I said all that, to give you the instance of when we go put in something to there, we're kind of saying, hey, we need this in order to accomplish this deal, we're meeting your requirements, and so we'd like to have this money. And a lot of times we get it. We have a lady here, her name is Heather, and she does pretty good at getting us that grant funding. And so that helps out immensely. Okay, so I was on the Bayview Business Park. That's 1.3. Uh, Marina's 1.5. Fiber was 30. And we're not going to get that. I already know we're not going to get that because we violated one of those little one of those little rules that, that they have in place, and that is you have to section things off. What we proposed was, with, we're, we're up to concrete right now, and we proposed to push the whole east end, you know, all the way up to Rock Park, Marble Mount. we got to go all the way around to Darrington, because Skagit County cuts off just before you get to Darrington. So we have to go around Swaddle, all that up there. And our proposal was to spend about 25, it came in at 30, and so we proposed all that, and the state said, no, you can't do it that way. So you only get segments, you only get portions. So they've only given us 7 million. They're, they're indicating, we haven't gotten the money yet necessarily, but they're indicating we're only going to get 7 million of that, which means then this is the timing issue that the public, me included, doesn't understand, you know, that, that when they do this. So now when do we, we have to wait till next year to do that again. And what are we going to do? Well, we have to ask for it more compartmentalized, which means we may get another $7 million. So over the course of four or five years, the $30 million that we wanted this year, that's how long it's going to take us to get all that done. And, of course, people in these outer lying communities, because there's a state effort to improve uh, Internet, they want it now. We get several letters a month from people who live in these outer lying areas. My kids can't do this. You know, we can't do that. And they, they just, unfortunately, as me, because I was just a citizen a year and four months ago, they don't understand how the process works. There's just all these little tenants that you have to satisfy in order for that $30 million to come together. Okay? So so we propose that. We're only going to get about $7 million of that, which means we're only going to have a piece of it. Now, there's another thing. Thank you, Jay Finley, for pointing this out. A month and a half or so ago, I was talking, and Jay goes, Hey, Malin, you know this is true? And I said, No, I didn't know. Um, and what, what's true? When the Navy gave us all this property, here. It came with a string, just like a lot of the things that I'm talking about. And the string that's attached to it is, is anything that we do with this property has to stay in the airport funding. So everything that happens over here in this business park, the money, any profits that we receive there has to be spent at this airport. Now, luckily, there's enough money there where we can draw all the profits out of there and, and never be behind. And that's something that I didn't know. Um, so you just think, oh, there's businesses out here, and you think, well, they got to be making something. They're paying us lease and different things like that, and we can just take that money and go spend it on the marina, or we go, we can't. We have to spend it here on the airport, and I didn't know that, so it's one of the things I've learned in the last year and four months, and now you know. Um, so if you see a lot of businesses sprawling out here, um, and you think, why don't they just go down here and do this and do that, we won't be able to. All right, so I said all that to say this. We bought, a few years before I became a commissioner, we bought all this land out here where the fire department is. We bought all that out there. And so it's called the Watershed Business Park. 
we're going to begin to develop that. And that won't be tied to the airport property. So that's a good thing. So if we make a profit out there, we can use the money as the port sees fit on the, on the several business districts and things that we have. Paying for Swift Center until we get a business to go out there. Okay, so that's how that kind of works to give you that. All right, and then for administration, we have 100000 that we have to spend. And that's pretty cheap. Um, 35 employees to do what the port does, I think, is very economical. I mean, you'd never, Boeing would never do anything that cheap economically with people. So, anyway. Well, they got more to sell. They, yeah, they, yeah, they're getting 160 million a rattle, right? We're not. So, and that's, that's a good thing. Um, and so I'm still trying to wrap my head around that particular piece. All right. So, what are we doing this year? Um, there's a real um, concern about snow and snow removal. Um, we don't have that necessarily. And so we're gonna buy a new uh, snow removal uh, machine. And so that's $290,000 we're gonna go spend on that. That's a good thing, you know. Now I don't like to spend money, especially don't like to spend your money. I, I don't think, you know, actually no real politician that I've met so far really likes to just go out and splurge money. They all have an idea about what they think is best for people. You know, you may agree with their idea or, or not, but that's their true incentive. Their true incentive is, is I think the state ought to spend $50 million, you know, on a poly one. You may not agree with that, you know, and that's where the political, you know, uh, what, tumultuousness, if you want to call it that, comes from. All right. So, but nonetheless, most people I meet do have an idea as to why we should do something, right? And I think it's really important that you express your ideas because the port, we're an entity. We, we, we take public input, you know, and I've been to uh, 14 of these meetings now, uh, monthly meetings, and I've only had, Jay comes a, a lot, um, but other than that, we don't see a lot of people, and so if you don't express your, your views to the staff, uh, we, won't, uh, we won't know what to do. So I'll give you an example. A guy called me in November, and he said, hey, Malin, he said, uh, he said, the port doesn't see me as a commercial business anymore at the, at the marina. And, uh, and so I remember in June, we passed a resolution. We gave it to the port staff to improve, because we're, we're, we're low on, on money, to improve all of the benefits or bonuses that we're giving to people. Well, one of the things that we did in 1974, we allowed businesses who parked their boats at the marina to get it at 25% of the rate. Our marina harbor master came back to us. He said, that's too low. We should at least improve it to 50%. And this is all done in June. And so, okay, let's do that. But let's tighten our belt and let's make sure everybody that's in the commercial area is actually a commercial fisherman, right? Mm. Okay. Here's an unintended consequence that we did. And it's just because things were done in 1974. And, you know, smart as any of us can be, we didn't necessarily go back and read all the small details about what qualified as a marine business in our marina. Turns out it was very specific. You had to be a salmon fisherman and you had to be this. And this guy deals in oysters. He'd been getting the benefit for five years, but when the harbor master saw, oh, you're not a salmon fisherman and you don't have this and you don't have that, what did he do? He went over there and told, uh, yeah, True Oceans, I think the True Oceans or whatever their name is. Uh, I remember, I just, I, I just slipped my mind, but it's just like, he said, you don't get any more, <laughs> you know? And so he was told that in November. So he calls me, he says, hey, we're a business. I have a license from the Washington Fish and Wildlife that says I'm a commercial fishing operation. And you guys are, you know, and these are the kind of things that you deal with sometimes as a port, you know? So I, you know, I, I contact the executive director and I say, hey, and she, oh yeah, you guys tighten the belt. And this is what happens. And Chris went out and looked at it. Chris Omdahl's our harbor master. And he said, so he doesn't qualify anymore. True. By the letter of the law, he doesn't qualify qualify anymore. It's in the policy. So what has to happen? And this is something that all of us need because I'm, I'm woefully disabled in this realm. When you write a policy, the staff lives to the policy. That, that's all they can do. They're required to live by that policy. So they can't do anything for Francisco is the guy's name. They can't do anything for him. They go, look, man, this is the policy. You know? So what do you have to do? You have to rewrite the policy. <laughs> How long does that take? <laughs> Months. We just approved it a couple weeks ago. So from November until April, he's still paying the commercial rate until we rewrite the policy that includes him in this process. Why am I telling you this? Because sometimes the EAA or whoever may want the port to change something but when we rewrite policy, there's a whole process to it. First, the staff has to do it. Second, we have to review it. Third, it's got to go to legal. So we got to go to the, to the legal entity to make sure we're not making some big grandioso error, you know. And the wording is important. You know, I had some words. 
And they said, oh, if we say it like that, this can happen. You know, somebody will take advantage of us. If we say it like that, this will happen, and, and somebody will take advantage of us. And you're a legal entity when you're a, when you're a public uh, 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 position like we're in uh, government. And whatever you write is what you have to live with, <laughs> you know. And you'd be surprised how many people have their lawyers they're on staff at their companies, right? We write a bad policy, their legal team looks at it and they go, boom, this is what we're going to do. You know, they go over and start pushing buttons and then we live with the roll down until we can rewrite the policy again in order to fix things, right? So that was a long conversation to, to tell you a little bit about uh, how things work um, as far as the port's concerned. So we got the wording, we passed it, and then uh, TransOceans is their name, uh, now gets their, their, uh, their benefit. And it's 50% versus 25%. Uh, the reason why we moved to 50% is because too many people that are there leave for the summer and they don't come back and then they let all their friends come in and put their big sailboats and stuff like that in on the commercial property. That's allowed. By policy, that's allowed. But the harbor master thought, eh, we're giving them too good, a, that's too good a deal, you know, to let your buddies come in and do that. And so we changed it to 50%. It's been there since 1974 because fishing has always been hard around here. And so the port, at the time we wanted to build the marina, we built in that policy in order to, to help the public understand that the port is a public caring group. And they really are. Go ahead, John. So the port doesn't charge transient mortgage for those people that are gone for the summer? Not not in the commercial routes, no. And it's in the policy. They're allowed to do that. Yeah. So. Unbelievable. Yeah. It's the, way it, yeah, it's the way it is since 74. But the so. business is still paying. Right? Yeah, the business still pays the mortgage, and that's why we raised it to 50%. So they're doing that. We don't, you know, we're not... And, and the big, the boats that usually you have trouble with is the 40, 50 footers, because if you know anything about boats, those are the slips that you can't get. You can get a lot of 30 foot. Matter of fact, 30 foots every winter go short. We don't have enough boats, but by April, they'll all be filled up, you know. And the, but the, the 40, 50 footers, once a guy gets that slip, you're on a waiting list for 10 years to get one. John? Do they charge the private, in the private slips, the privately ten, uh, rented slips, do they charge transient guys that are using those slips? You know, I, I don't know that that's watched. So, like, if your sailboat's in there and you pull out and your friend pulls in, I don't know if, if they watch well, that. They, that's the way they do it for a for it's big time. Do they? Yeah. Oh, God, they make okay. three or four times the normal rent rate. I see. Yeah, okay. If subletting you're talking about, yeah. Well, it's, it's just transient mortgage. Like a landing fee, right? Sure. They, I mean, they might charge 30 or This is back, I don't know when, but... You know, my monthly mortgage is like 160 bucks a month or something. And during the summer or sometime, if my boat wasn't in the slip, they charge some, a transient person. Oh, yeah, we do that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you do that. Yeah, I thought I thought you were talking about the owner subletting. No, we do that. That's okay. that's on our policy. Yeah, Don. Uh, uh, yeah, at Skyline the Marina, there is that difference in the uh, port one there by Cap Sandy. Is is that more private? Yeah. Skyline is private, yeah. Well, so you know, I, I own a slip there and I don't have a boat, so I let my friends and I use it at no charge. Yeah, and, and, and it's, it's probably in your rental contract as to what you can do or not do. So, yeah, anyway, and like I said, I, I don't, like I was saying about the personal, I don't know if you let somebody else use your slip or whatever, you know, because you're gone or whatever. I, I don't know that the port goes out and looks at all that. It'd take a lot of bodies just to go out and write down all the letter, you know, numbers and try to figure that out. So. If they use it on a regular basis, they like to have insurance company, that port... They call it the port guy, the guy that runs it there, uh -huh. he usually wants to know if you're letting somebody use it a lot if they have insurance. Right. But they keep tabs on it. Yeah. Do they? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and that's our big thing too. Is you have to have insurance. So, and, and the and the port has to be a partner on your insurance policy as well. So, if anything goes wrong, the port can be one of the payees, because if you sink a boat or whatever, it costs a lot of money Turn to get the dark. right get that thing out of there. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, we have to improve our fiber uh, operations for all the gates, and that's we're going to spend thirty five thousand on that. This is just some of the the upkeep. Um, one of the, the sad things that's happened is, is because of the crime nature in Skagit County, because it's rising, it's rising up all over, we've had to reinstitute security. Uh, we've had to, so now you'll, you'll see our security guys, you know, out here in cars driving around after hours or whatever. So and that's going to cost 45000 And so, you know, when you hear some of these public programs, you know, that they're not going to put people in jail or they're not going to prosecute people or whatever, and the crime level comes up, it costs you because we have to pay for security because we have a lot of equipment, a lot of money around here. And that's one of the unintended consequences of sometimes of public policy. And I'm not getting into public policy because there's 800 views in here and there's only 20 of us. All right. <laughs> 
This year, we promised uh, several years ago uh, in the uh, the, the uh, uh, FAA look at what we should do around here, uh, 422 uh, wasn't necessarily prescribed to be on the, the budget. It, we can't use any of the money that we get from the FAA. We get 156000 a year from the FAA just for maintenance costs every year. Um, and we can't use any of it for 422 because they're not necessarily in agreement that we should that they should fund that runway. So federally, we don't get any money for that. But we're going to spend a half a million dollars. Anybody landed on 422 lately? Yeah. How's it looking? <laughs> Yeah, it's okay, but the rocks are coming up and whatever. So we're gonna we're gonna spend a half a million dollars this year to go out and and redo that. And we should get some county funding. Go ahead. What are you gonna do to it? We're gonna we're gonna, we're gonna resurface it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's so. Gonna happen this year? It's on the budget. Yeah. So. I mean, the actual resurfacing will, will happen this year. It's in the budget. That's all I can say because we don't have all the money. <laughs> we're right back to we got to go out and get money from the county and different things. Yeah. What happened to the issue that the FAA is not happy with the spacing between the taxiway and full force? Still, okay, so let's talk about that just for a second. So taxiways and things are qualified with a, with a category, right? If you have a category, then you have to have wingtip, wingtip clearance from the runway to the taxiway. Well, that taxiway, the category that it sits in right now, you don't have the wingtip clearance to the center line of the runway. So what do you do? Well, the FAA would tell us that we have to stop operations. But they give us, they give us a little leeway, and this is, you know, so this is some things that you need to wrap your head around about, about fairness. They give you an initial five-year extension, and that's what we're on right now. We just approved that last year, so we can extend it for five years. Um, Heather went and did a, a, a estimate. We go to the county. We have them estimate what it's going to take for us to do. They estimated that it would take us. We have to move the runway 90 feet to the to the west, and they estimated it will take 5.1 million to do that. Now that might not be true. It might be 5.5 or it may be 4.7, but the number we have right now is 5.1 million. And so to move it, um, and then you go to our port funds and you go, we don't have $5 million. We just don't have it. This is, the port is not that, not that uh, rich of a, a port. Uh, we do okay, but we're not rich. And so what do you do? And the answer is, is you get to sit in that category for five years, and then we get one more extension, and then that will take us to 10 years, and then after that, we'll have to do something about it. So uh, we, we will be tied. Moving the runway is not feasible because it gets too close to the buildings. No, it's feasible. I mean, I'm screwing taxi with. It's I'm moving too the taxi, which is cheaper, cheaper paving. Well, yeah, but we'd have to move into buildings that are already approved and built. So that that's so the problem. The building is too tight. You got right. to move the runway because you can't move the taxi. Way. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh -huh. What about limiting to smaller sized aircraft where the wing tips spin? We could do that. We could change the taxiway, uh, the taxiway. But long term, um, if you give things back, it's hard to go back then and get it redone. And so, and so that's the that's the other issue about that runway. Um, Kevin Ware uh, had a, had an idea. He said, "Hey, you know, rather than repave it 90 feet over, let's turn it into a grass runway." You know, so we went out and got the numbers for that. That's about three something million. That's not that's not free either because you got to bring in the rocks and the baseline and everything else. And so, what to do? You know, and, and so that's what the port commission and the port staff is is left with. What are we going to do with that runway? We're on a timer. We got about nine years left of that timer, and we want to do something with it. Um, my effort as a commissioner is to keep that runway. I think we ought to keep it. And uh, so although the FAA and all, we, we, uh, there's aviation division. How many people know about the WPPA, Washington Public Ports Association? Nobody knows about that. That's interesting. They are a main fighter for you, whether you know it or not. That bill HB 1554 that was going around about getting rid of leaded fuel or whatever, the WPPA, we have, a, we have a, a, an advocate that goes to all the legislative sessions and everything else, and they fought to make sure that that thing didn't go through as written. Now, I, I hear the opinions, right? Should we get rid of blood fuel? Absolutely. I mean, who wants, who wants their kids to breathe that? Nobody. All right. So we should get rid of it. And maybe the federal government, you know, like uh, Jay said, the Eagle program and different things like that, maybe they're dragging their feet. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not at that level. I don't want to be at that level. But at some point in time, it needs to be gotten rid of, you know. So you do a little research on it. You find out Lycoming has already hardened all of their cylinder tops. What happens is the valve spins a little bit, you know, when you, when you run it. And that valve, when it spins around, grinds on, that, on the seat that it sits in. If it's hardened, 
That's how all these cars out here work. They're hardened seats, they're hardened uh, valve guides. And so you can run without unleaded fuel and it's fine. Well, t Lycoming had done that uh, in the late 90s, I think, is when they started improving all of their cylinders. So if you have a Lycoming, you probably are in, in not very much trouble. But some of the Continental cylinders haven't been done like that yet. And so you got a business, they're selling product. The federal government is hooked to those businesses. I'm hooked to businesses here in product. And so as a public entity, then you have to entertain all of those opinions. You do. Continental has to come in and say why they haven't hardened their seats and different things like that. And as you assemble these meetings and these, uh, these group discussions, there's outcomes. And they say, well, if we do that, we have to spend $58 million, you know, to make a new this and that and whatever it is or $100 million. I'm just making up numbers to let you know that con it's going to cost Continental engines something. You know, it's not free to them. And so this is some of the reasons why when you have these meetings at the federal level, they make decisions, they come down to the state level. The state says we don't want the lead in the water uh, and everything else. And so they're making a decision with HB 1554. That came out of the Ecology Committee. Just so you know how it works a little bit, and boy, we're going to run out of time here really quick. I don't know if we'll get as far as I wanted to, but that's okay. Um, so it comes out of the Ecology Committee, and they vote it out. And it comes back to the floor, and then they say, okay, who really owns this thing? Well, the Department of Transportation owns it. So what happens? It goes right back into committee. So it comes out. HB 1554 goes right back in. And then they talk about what the Department of Washington State Department of Transportation requirements are. They have their own legal staff. They look at the legal problems associated with what the ecology people want to do. And then it comes out as a SHB 1554, which is supplemented, I think is what, the, what, what they used. All right, supplemented means the DOT goes right, and they write in there, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do that, because the federal government, same thing we suffer with, has hooks, lines, and sinkers with money that goes to SeaTac, money that comes to Burlington. And so you start making these rules at a local level, the federal government says, fine, you can make your rule because they believe in state autonomy, but we're not going to send you any money. <laughs> you know. So the DOT knows that. So their guys go through, they mark it all up, and they write all this stuff out, you know, and they change it. It comes out as a supplemental HP. And I sent you that portion, and then it comes out as an ESHP. Was it the Enhanced Supplemental House Bill 1554? What happened with that bill? It came down to where the DOT has to send out flyers to tell you you're burning leaded gasoline, which is poisoning the earth. Um, you have to keep it so far away from children. Uh, limit the amount of fuel you throw on the ground. Limit your engine run-up areas where there's no children present, you know, and different things like that. That's what actually came out of the bill. And the WPPA, they, they send me stuff all the time during this type. They wrote and they said, hey, 1554 is not to worry. They just, they, they just said our... Or we're not going to go in and argue any more for it because it's a non it's a non event, right? It's just going to be the DOT telling us the port. But the first one came out with punishment, right? The Department of Ecology would come up here and see if we met all their mandates, and if we didn't do it, then there was going to be there was going to be monetary punishment to the port. All of that's been taken out. So that's how the process works, and I can use that bill because you're interested in it. Um, so comes out goes back in, comes out, goes back in again. It finally came out for the last time and the WPPA said it's a non-event. It, it, it won't hurt us uh, as far as that. So we'll still have leaded aviation fuel, but we all should be on the same page that leaded aviation fuel is not that great. We know how to do it. Every car out there doesn't use lead, right? So we know how to do it. It doesn't foul up your plugs. There's all kinds of good reasons not to use it. And so, but the engine manufacturers and the FAA have to come along because these are certified pieces of equipment. Somebody went out and ran those engines for thousands of hours up and down, minimum oil, minimum this, whatever, and they certified that cylinder, right? And it cost millions of dollars. That cylinder is approved. Now for them to go do a hardened one, you know, it takes a lot. You, Don, you worked for Boeing. You know how that is when you when you come back in, you know, and you have to recertify something. It's a lot, and it takes a lot of manpower and a lot of hours and a lot of time and a lot of money. So that's how it kind of works. So the FAA, I think, could work a little faster. That's just my two cents. Malin Hall, not the port. Um, but I just, I just uh, hope that we do get this thing done so that all of our aviation engines are lead-free and we can just move on from that particular topic. Because it's been around for how many years, Jay? 20 years? <laughs> At least, yeah. So, anyway. All right. Everybody happy with that? All right. So, I know I got sidetracked just a little bit, but I wanted to explain to you a little bit about uh, how how uh, the refogging of 422 happens. And I asked about the 156,000, and everybody, because I'm the new guy, right? Everybody in the room 
no, you can't use any of that money. And it's just interesting, you know, because the FAA gives us that every year. You would think you could hold that off in a side account, you know what I mean, until you get your 500000 and then go out and refog the runway, but you can't do that. And so that's why I'm saying all these little things come with strings attached that I was never aware of. You're probably not aware of either. When you, when you apply for a grant, there's a certain criteria that you have to meet in order for that grant to be approved. We can help push the politics back out of some of these things now you know uh, you know you can go to covid you know and I, if i asked in this room and we wrote it down privately what do you really believe about covid i bet you i get 40 different answers about what people believe about you know uh, remdesivir and all these different things that came out all right so but that's how the government works it's just the way it works and there's strings and there's hooks attached to things so you all pay taxes you pay federal taxes you you know most of you own homes so you pay that you buy gasoline in washington state those taxes don't come to the port they go to other entities and I know I've already said that but I want that to be clear the port through its leasing doesn't make enough money to pay for all these programs so we have to go out we have no choice but to go out and ask for these grants and these things like that and the legislators they were elected they set the tone you know and we have to go meet that tone and we have to go meet those criteria if we accept to get those granted so that, that understood everybody, everybody get that pretty clear all right Okay, and with that, uh, we're going to buy a, uh, a new vehicle. Um, why? Uh, it's, a, it's an electric vehicle um, because there's money for that. Uh, we, can, we can get a, a grant to go out and to begin to replace our carbon burning vehicles with an electric vehicle because it's a political incentive by those who are in the legislature and in the Senate. So we're going to go, we're going to go get a, an electric car. What's and so, it be? what's that? What's it going to be? I'm not sure just yet. So it's going to be for, it's going to be for the, uh, Keith Love is probably going to have actually the, the keys to that. And so anyway, um, but that's another $76,000, but it won't be our money. Some of it will be, but most of it will be grants and different things for these two programs. Right what's that? An E-Ray? I'm not sure what they're getting. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, some brand new Tesla. <laughs> 76000 that much for, what would you say now? You got to get the, the uh, flat, the ludicrous mode flat Tesla. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Run it out on the runway. So but we had to approve that. So just so you know, uh, the commissioners, they can't do that without our, our permission. And so the commissioners have to look at that and... Everybody knows a Tesla costs what, 150 grand, 160 grand, or whatever. This is this is a $70,000 vehicle, and so it's not in the upper range and it's not in the lower range. And I think every commissioner on the panel would have said, "No, we're not spending $200,000 on a new vehicle here at the port, even if the state gave us 50% of the money or whatever." So that's one of the things that your commissioners do do for you. Um, we look at that, and the staff knows that they know they have to bring it to us, you know, and they know they have to to try to get that to go by. All right, we're over time, but I want to give you one more one more philosophy that I think that I'm bringing to the port that is it's not new but I'm reinferring it um, one of the things that just this comment just got made on Tuesday uh, by a port uh, uh, staff that um, they they in their heart of hearts they honestly believe that flying out here is just for pleasure okay that's that's a of all the sentiments people have that's one of them I disagree, unfortunately. Um, so you're going to go to Mount Vernon, right? You're going to you're going to engage with some kids. We've been doing we've been doing Young Eagles for a long time. Um, I started flying out here in 1979, believe it or not. I got into a crosswind. I was in a PA 28 uh, 140, and uh, I got into a crosswind situation. I couldn't get the wing low enough, you know. And I had eight hours or whatever I had, you know, out there soloing around, and I couldn't get it on the runway. You know, so I went out and I said, "Well, I'm just going to land on 422." So I went over and landed on 422. I was, I was scared to death. I was. I was 19 years old. I was, I was afraid out of my mind. So I told my instructor over here. You know, Burlington Aeroplane used to be right where Dyberg is. Those offices there. Burlington Aeroplane used to be right there in those offices that the port has now has. So I came in. Oh, I told my instructor, I landed on the wrong runway. You know, and he goes, "What are you talking about?" I said, "Well, the wind was too high, so I went landed there." He goes, "Good job. That's exactly what you should have done, right?" So that's a memory that I'm never going to lose the rest of my life. And it's one of the things that I hold very dear in that I believe that our pilots of the future are coming from little airports like this. I believe the federal government should support an airport like this. I believe the port needs to support an airport like this. And I don't think all the flying that we do is for pleasure. I just don't believe that. There's a percentage of it, maybe that's for pleasure, but there's a percentage of it that keeps us viable. Let's say the whole world fell apart. 
right? Whole world just falls apart. If you know anything about flying, you get rusty after just six months and you get really rusty after a couple of years. Okay, well, I'm flying my airplane. Could I go jump in a C-130 that I have over 5,000 hours in and fly it? I could tomorrow. I mean, do you, ha do you have FSX, you know? They, they have the C-130 mod, you know, the, flight, the Microsoft flight. I can go in there, I know, I know exactly. The C-130 is a DC airplane. Why? Because it was designed in the 50s. They didn't, they weren't using AC. The AC 120 volts, way too high. So everything's DC in the airplane. So how do you start it? You have to set up the DC bus. So if you go in there, if anyone wants to steal a C-130, it's difficult to do because you've got to know how to set up that bus. And if you don't set the bus up right, you'll never get any power to the igniters. You'll never get the thing started, right? So you've got to go in there, turn the battery on, do this, dash one on the inverters, you know, different things like that. I can do that in my sleep, you know? So I don't have to go read the Microsoft book that's this thick about how to start a C-130. I already know how to start the thing, you know? And, and uh, you know, uh, altimeter, airspeed, and, and ADI and all that stuff. If you're you're doing it a lot, it maintains pretty much its familiarity. So I think it's way more important than that because if everything really fell apart, I was a regular officer. What does that mean? It means I can never retire. That's just what I get to 60, I get my money, but I can never legally retire. If you're a reserve officer, you get to retire. You don't, you know, but if you're a regular officer, you came from the academy or you're promoted as a reserve officer, I can go back in the military anytime. Matter of fact, a couple of years ago when they were short on C-130 pilots just before I retired from Boeing, I thought for sure I was going to get a letter, <laughs> you know, because they were, so, they were C-3, which means you can't deploy, you can't go into combat and all these other things, which is a big deal. And I was under the age of 60, and I thought, oh, my goodness, you know, <laughs> they could send me a letter, and I'd have to go back into active duty, and that would be the way that it is. So I think flying out here at this airport is more than pleasure. So I'll give you my last example. So this last year, inflation's out of control. Right? So the staff, they put together the numbers. We're looking at these numbers. We're looking at our budget. We're looking at our costs. We're looking at employees and everything else. We had to give our employees an 8% raise. Why? Because everything's up 8%. How do you pay for that? You know? Well, the answer is you got to go to the hangers. <laughs> you got to say, oh, well, you know. And so the proposal was to increase the hanger rates. I think it was between 10 and 11%, something like that. They write me and I say, I'm not doing that. <laughs> I said, I'm not voting for that. I just, that's what I wrote back to the executive director. I'm not voting for that. Let's find a different number. So they asked me, they said, why'd you say that? And I said, well, because last year we raised the hangar prices down here about five, six percent. You know, we did. And so, and I wasn't part of that. That was before I got on, got on, got on board. And I said, I just think it's too much for people to have to just, you know, for us to try to stay with CPI, and we're having a new discussion on that. We started that discussion on Tuesday. To try to stay with CPI, we'll outprice all of our businesses, we'll outprice everybody. And so there's this modicum of what do we do for businesses, just as the marina thing we talked about, and what do we do for pleasure, right? And so I'm, I'm really involved in that conversation because I want people to have a hangar here that is affordable, you know. The thought is, you guys are paying $150,000 for your airplane. How many people own a $150,000 airplane in this room? I bet you there's a couple of you. No? Okay. It's not wrong for them to think that because a lot of airplanes are $150,000, right? Mine's forty, you know, and if I need a cylinder tomorrow, but first my wife's going to be pissed because it's going to cost probably $2,500, $3,000 and she doesn't want to spend any more money on it. You know, and, and those are the, that's the reality of what I live in. That's the place where my mind comes from. And so that's, that's just a presence that I bring to the poor. Kevin Ware's on board at the airport. And Steve Omdahl does mostly agriculture, just so you know what our, our different divisions are. And so I'm trying to bring that, not so we get behind the power. You can't get behind the power curve. Because, you know, if you do 10% raise here and 5% here, and then you just do the same raises over 20 years, there's the, the, end, the end line is going to be a, a significant difference in cost, right? And so we have to be careful of that because every time you don't give a sufficient amount of raise here over the years, you can get too far behind. And then all of a sudden, we have to go to the people that are in the hangars and whack them with a 15% deal in order to stay with the economy because our prices, our costs continue to go up, okay? And we talked about that last time. Our utility bill right here on the airport is 400000 Go ahead. From the point of view of the port, is there a difference between a private pilot and a pleasure boater? I don't, well, um, it depends maybe who you talk to on that. If you talk to maybe Keith or Chris, you know, the, the two marina and, and airport, or you talk to our property so person. Is, there, is, is a person who has a pleasure boat more desirable 
to, um, do, do they have more right to that? I don't than think so. You have to your pleasure airplane? I don't think so. I don't think there's any sentiment like that. There's no difference in attitude right. about it. Yeah, I don't think there's, a, there's no sentiment there for me. Go ahead. I'm a little confused when you say that you raised the rates 10%. Uh, we didn't. Pardon? We didn't. That was the proposal. The proposal was 10.7, I think, something like that. I think I got raised 40%. I went from 550 to 750. Over two years. No. Well, when, right, the first year, I went from 550 to 750. I don't know what it's going to be next. I, I don't know where you come up with your numbers. I have them right here, so anyway, I have the left that, That's what I'm paying. That's yeah. what I'm paying. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. I know. There's. I know. Over the last two years, there's been significant raises. The first raise that you probably got hit with, I wasn't a commissioner here, and that just happened. That's, what I'm talking about. That's probably the one you're talking about. Yeah, and I can go get those numbers. But yeah. So, but this year, because of the raise last year that was voted on by a different commission, that's why I said I'm not voting for that. You know, and they try to, they try to get uniformity among the commissioners. That's a, that's a high priority for the staff to do. So the staff is good in that way. They listen. You know, and the other two commissioners listened as well, and they said, okay, we agree. So they lowered it to eight percent, and the the overall, the overall raise, I think, was eight point something percent, and so we, we did okay, I think, in that. The best we could do, because our costs are going up. It's not free to, to run the port. So. But you have to realize, five percent this year, five percent next year is based on the five percent here. Right. The, okay. the percentage, or the, the amount moves up humongous after a few years. Right. So the, the other thing that I proposed, and I don't know if it'll get any traction or not, just so you know what I'm doing when I'm in these meetings, they're public. I propose that we only raise rates every other year. I think that's fair um, because, you know, I rented how I rented a house for like 12 years, and if I had a good renter, you know what I do? I don't raise the rate at all <laughs> because you know what it's like to have a bad renter. It's awful, and then you get into this quid pro quo, and then before they leave, what do they do? They kick holes in the walls, they tear the place apart, which leaves you thousands of dollars to go fix the house up. So if you have a good renter, you leave them alone. Can't necessarily do that here because, like I say, this is a public entity, and our costs are going up. So but that's that's my current deal that I gave to our real estate and properties manager. I, I think I think that would be best because then you know every odd year we're going to adjust your rent to somewhere around CPI or somewhere around the market. The, the year in between, maybe you go do your dine-on. Maybe you go, you know what I mean, maybe, maybe you do something extra because you know for that particular year you'll have a little bit more money. You're talking about um, fiber. Is there, is there fiber on the airport now? There is, yeah. So, mm -hmm. uh, how does one access it? Oh, no. Well, so this is for our, this is for the gate security system. So it's not, not fiber for any access? Right. Not right. Not fiber for that. Yep. Uh -huh. I think the one thing you need to keep in mind is you raise your rates, it's a lot more to pay on 5% over $1,000 than 5% on $500. Right. So as, as these rates have been going up, like what I said, I went from 550 to 750 and then you raise it another 8%, that's a, that's more, a lot more significant than you raising it on 550 I, yeah. I think you need to think about that as you yeah. move along. We are, yeah. And so that, that's, that, that's what I was trying to say. If you raise 10% here, you know, on 500 and 10% on 1,000, by the time you go out 20 years, the guy that you did a 10% here, even though you do the same over, he's going to be making, paying, whatever you want to call it, a lot, a lot more. What you have, what you have as, I, as I see it, is you have some fixed costs. You already have the fixed cost in the facility. What you don't have fixed on is, is your labor cost and things of that nature. Right. Your, your facility is already... Whatever that cost is already there. And as far as the increases in utilities, you pass that on to us as tenants. Right. And so, to me, that's a pretty big jump at 8% or whatever it is like that. Uh, when you consider the cost of what, how much more you really have into that particular facility. Right, and so look at it, look at look at this from a global perspective, rather than just facility and facility costs. We had a we had an interesting discussion on Tuesday about this very thing. Um, there's a there's a proposal because a, a business they struggle sometimes, right? COVID roll down different things like that. So the proposal is is that we help them because we because our our charter is to have jobs right in this community. That's our charter as a port, and so. So it, let's say like we just go, nope, we're not helping them. Pay us our money or we're taking you to court. Well, you know, they go out of business, we lose the 60, 80, 100 jobs, whatever they have. Well, that's not a good rational position for us to take as a port. So, but if I give them that, 
right? Then somebody else has to pay it. That's just the way it is, you know? And so, and so how do we manage that as a port? And this is, this is what, you're, what you're driving at, what I'm trying to get you to comprehend. It's not just the hangar costs. It's not just the, the runway costs. It's, it's comprehensively, and we're restricted because this business district can only be used for this. So we have some strings and different things that are attached. And so we look at all that, and that's why I didn't agree with the raise proposal. And it's not a big deal, but it's just something I said, I'm not going to do that because I know what I knew what happened. And I used to rent a port hanger. I was a port hanger renter for 10 years. So I was in 109F down there for 10 years. So I'm trying to help the best that I can on that. But still, what I told you happens, happens. 10.4 million out here. Well, the FAA only gives 90%, <laughs> which means what? You know, I mean, we get the other million, and then we have to go out, and we have to try to get the county to help us. How do we get them to help us? Hey, you know, uh, corporate air has 50 jobs. You know, this guy over here has 60 jobs, that guy over there. And, and, and so now we're tying back into my first comments about they're paying taxes, they're buying fuel, they're, the county is benefiting, the state is benefiting, all boats are rising, but you have to send us some money back, you know what I mean, so that when we get these extra bills and extra costs, we can pay them. Uh, I'll give you another example, and I know we're running over time, but we were digging a hole out here to change the sewer system that we had to do to improve the site. Um, and the county drawings and the way things were supposed to be underground wasn't the way that it is, you know. And so when we got the hole opened up, you know, we have guys that, that do this. They come and they go, can't do it, <laughs> you know. Well, what, what do you mean we can't? We can't do it for the money that you've given. Well, what, how much are we going to have to give you? You're going to have to give us another $200,000 in order to make that sewer line and everything line up. Drawings, supposed to be like this. When you open up the ground, it's not like that. And so then, I don't know, I'm new, this was June of last year, you know, and I go, wow, that's terrible, you know, and I said that publicly. And Kevin Ware goes, he goes, he, in, in public, he said, well, he said, just be thankful it's not more than 20%. <laughs> he says, if it's under 20%, you got a great deal. Now, he's, he's been a commissioner for 20-something years, and so that's his experience speaking about some of the anomalies and different things that we face as a public entity. And those are things that I'm coming to light on and coming to knowledge on. And like I said, when I was just a citizen, I didn't understand. Why did they lay a new road, and then 10 minutes later, they dig it up to put in a sewer line or whatever? And the answer is, it's, it's, the, way, it's the unfortunate way that governments work sometimes in the way the process goes. So, yeah. I hope this is a good question for everybody in the room, and maybe you have a logical explanation. I apologize for putting you on the spot, but maybe you have the answer. Why, two or three years ago or four, whatever it's been, the, the court the port did not approve a uh, T-hanger construction on the cargo ramp? Now, three or four years later, years later, the ports approved the construction of 12 40 by 60, or 60, excuse me, 4,200 square foot box hangers on the cargo ramp, which was untouchable three or four years ago. Can you give us a logical explanation for that? I can't. The executive director, uh, Sarah, just changed a year and four months ago. So I don't know what the, I don't know what the, okay. I, I don't know what the political environment was like. I don't know what, the, so let me tell you something else. The port, it's been quite a few years ago. Jay would have the exact number, but I don't have it, uh, and he had to go. But, but not too many years ago, this port went down to an airport, Hillsborough Airport in California, because they're looking, they're look, we're looking for a model. Right, and we all do that, right? We, we're looking for a model as to how do we want our airport to go. And so back then it was decided that if we were gonna build an airport in Skagit County, we'd like for it to look like that. Those decisions were made long before I ever got here. So one of the tumultuousness that happened because of that is Vertex Aviation wanted to build their own building, right? And so their initial drawings showed this, and then a secondary drawing because of the expense and everything else, and the door height and whatever. So the port kind of said yes to that, and then when the roll down came, they said no to that, and it caused a real it caused a real hubbub. You know, I was a brand new commissioner trying to understand what happened, and trying to wrap my head around why do we have such high door requirements over here on this side, but not over on that side? And it's because the decision was made long before any of us ever got here that that they want to make this airport into something that's financially viable. How much money does this airport make every year? 
It doesn't. <laughs> That's the problem, right? It loses about 1.2 million. It's 30,000 on the on the on the land management side, and it's 1. Point something million on the on the services side. So, so we're 1.2 million something in the hole. Who pays for that? The taxpayer does. And you know, I was talking to to Dan. Dan's a very uh, bright individual. I talk to him a lot. I get good answers uh, from him. You know, and should I, as a port commissioner, now transfer all that 1.1 million cost to the hangar owners and everything else? And the answer is. No. How did I get that answer? Because Dan shared with me, you guys don't receive 100% of the value of this airport. The county receives a value, the state receives a value, the federal government receives a value because we could be an alternate airport if they needed to bring food in here. The military can land here. Our runways, our runways are going to get lengthened to 7,000 feet. So that's all a benefit to them, and the taxpayer should pay for that. That shouldn't be borne out to all the people who are using the airport here. The taxpayer does have an interest in helping to fund this airport. And one of the things that I've asked for in the last couple of months is I'd like to see a percentage. I'd like to see a percentage where we say the taxpayer should, should own up to 25% of all the costs out here. 75% of the costs are, are by the functional daily users. I haven't gotten that yet, and I don't know that I'll ever get it. It's something that I asked the executive director for, and she kind of went, yeah, hey, you know, that might be something that we need to entertain. That'll help all of us, because then we know, you know what I mean, when we're at 75%, you know what I mean, then the taxpayer will pick up the other part, and then we won't raise hangar rates because we're at our, we're at our number, you know, kind of thing. And then that way the, the cost load is shared rather than just kind of putting your finger in the wind and say, I think we'll do this this year or whatever. I don't think we really do that, but you know what I'm saying. It just, it just removes some of the liquidity out of the decision making and makes it more fashionable for us to say, the taxpayer should pay for this amount of the airport. Because literally, on the, on the port website, uh, this, this port generates about $66 million. This airport generates about $66 million in, in, in income for the community. But we don't get that back. That's the, that's the number one thing you have to know. We get the lease rates and different things, which isn't as much as, as what we're generating. One way if the port could make more money is it could, if it could increase the number of renters, tenants. Right. Both industrial and hangar. Right. And so that's the other thing. There's no more space in the buildable part of the airport. There's no more space. What are we doing? Well, this land up here that's just on the other side of the fuel pits, Many years ago, that was given as our EPA refuge. That was given into a, you know, a polywog, save the owl, you know, all that sort of stuff. Now, why anyone would give five acres of property, I think it's maybe 10 acres of property out here next to an airport for anything other than airport use, I don't know. But that, those decisions were made 20 years ago. So what they did, they probably never had the vision that the airport would get this big. Yeah, news for the owls aren't using it. Yeah, they're not. Yeah. <laughs> and I just use those as examples, and so don't, don't take that to, right to the ground floor. But what I'm saying is, we are working on right now, Heather is working on pulling that out of that uh, EPA protection zone so we can begin to expand the airport and build. One of the things that I'd like to do, and I've said it several times, uh, if we move the runway over 90 feet, we can punch through to the other side and we can build out that whole, that whole west side of that 422 runway. I said it on Tuesday, I think that's a gold mine, you know, but we have to have $5.1 million last year's cost to move that runway, and we don't get any support from the federal government. Where are we going to get that? And the answer is we'll have to work on it. Go ahead. Okay. Maybe somebody's already thought of this, but why don't you put the taxiway on the other side of that runway? That way you don't have the clearance problem. you got taxiways that go across the runway to the, to the hangars. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't know. Jay was on the was on the FAA reorganization committee. He may know the answer as to why that that didn't happen. Just I don't like know. It would be less expensive. Yeah. And that's one of the problems that I face only being around this a year and four months is I don't have all the background information as to why we've. We, I just know that right now the best proposal is to move that runway 90 feet to the west, and that's the cost of it. So that's my knowledge on it. All right. Mr. can you clarify? Uh, Make sure I understood this right uh, on this fiber thing. The port is involved with extending fiber into the valley. Yes, because back when Seattle was going through the gold rush, Alaska was going through the gold rush, rather, um, all around Lake Union, all around all of the ocean access was privately owned. So if you wanted to get through there, since you're going up to get gold, all of the local people said, oh, you're going to pay me, right? So they, they, they had these exorbitant prices for everything, right? And the state of Washington looked at that. How many people know that ports were invented in Washington State? 
Yeah, they were invented here. We, we invented the port, right? So the state legislature at the time said, this is right. I think it was 1911 uh, when this happened. Uh, maybe a little bit later. But 11 is when they initially did it, but maybe 41 or whatever that gold rush was. I think it was 11, I think. Anyway, it doesn't matter the years. But anyway, so the bottom line is, the bottom line is they created ports, and ports have the executive power to take property. We have that, we have that right. So what happened? 1965, the state said that's a lot of authority to give. Because you know, legally, I mean, I could go out here to anybody's farmland and say, I'm taking your property. And they'd say, oh, no, you're not. Oh, yeah, I am. RCW blah 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 says I can take it, you know, and just pay you the appropriate amount of money for it, and it's ours. And they can't fight it in court or anything else. The ports had that kind of power, so they restricted it in 1965. And what they said was is that the state also has to authorize this particular practice that we're doing. So when you go to these particular entities and these particular uh, types of, of things that we can do, the the social effort became in COVID. Everybody needs to have high speed internet. Right? So who has the interests over the whole county? The port does. Who has the ability to, to, to get on polls, you know, because polls are owned by PSE? Who has that privilege and that right? The ports do. So the state said, if we're going to get internet to everybody, we're going to give it to the ports. And so that's how we ended up with the, with the uh, communications process. The, the, the state voted, legislator voted on that, and it came back to us, and now we administrate it. But we asked for all the money. That zero cost to you guys. That, that is all money they give us. Go ahead. So this is a similar question. Uh, you haven't brought it up yet. How involved are you in bringing new power to the area? Yeah. That, that's, that, that. With this building that's going on on Peterson and what have you. Yeah. So what happened, there's not enough power up here on the hill. I don't know if you know that or not, but there's, there's not enough power up here on the hill. What happened? Well, um, Amazon built their facility down here. Amazon intent was to have charging vehicles, charging trucks, and all that stuff. There's multiple types of charging stations, okay? There's class one, there's class two, and then there's these really big ones, right? Okay, so... So if you're going to buy a moderate performing truck, right? So you go out here to Kenworth and you say, hey, what's your moderate performing truck? It goes 150 miles, right? As long as you're not going up steep hills and stuff like that. Um, it goes 150 miles. It takes uh, 50 amps and three phase power to charge that truck in three hours, right? So when you're building a building, you say, okay, if we're going to do this, that's what we have to have. So all that power is committed to that building. And we've heard that maybe Amazon, now that they're in the condition that they're in, they may not even inhabit that building. But all that power is still plumbed in out there, right? And so I was, when I heard that, I said, oh, man, we need to get our hands on some of that power so we can preserve it. Anyway, and the staff is looking at that. They kind of chuckled. And, and so, yeah, it, but it is a race, you know, between us and some of the others. And so then the, the question comes up is what to do about it because PSC will have to build something and who... Who takes that cost? And that's a whole myriad of people that have to be approached. The port can initiate it, but I think the county will have to be involved, you know, and even the even the possibility of a small nuclear power plant came up in that discussion, you know, about whether the port should entertain something like that. But port can run a nuclear yeah. power plant, right? We can. And but here's a lady in Richland, she, bless her heart, she uh, it's not the Richland port, but it's the port I can't remember what it's called. And she goes, I got more nuclear engineers per square mile than any other place on the planet, and I can't get a nuclear power plant approved. So that, that was the statement on that. So you're right. You bring up a very good point, and we don't have that resolved yet. Yeah, because we have to put charging stations out here to, to as part of our, our reduction of our CO2 footprint. So if you've got companies that have hard money that they put out based upon what P, PSE said that they would have for power, right, mm -hmm. included, and now they're saying instead of it being available in a year or a year and a half, it's going to be another five years. So you've got, you know, $5 million by now already on the ground based upon these decisions. These right. decisions have been made. Right. So, but, but you guys have some power, not power, but some influence. We can. That's right. Yeah. So, but to give, give you just a little background on that, Conway. The company that wanted to buy the property said, we need a spur. And so we approached Burlington Northern thinking, well, we're the poor. You know, we're going to ask for a spur. You know what they told us? Piss off. <laughs> Take the 
got off the video. No, that's what they told us. And so we went to a different port. We said, hey, how does this work? And they said, unless you're providing a great monetary advantage for the railroad, they don't have to do anything. The railroads were here long before all of it, and they have federal rights, they have state rights, they have all kinds of rights. And they didn't really say that, but that's, that, you know, we just basically got the real cold shoulder, and yeah, well, you're not going to get a spur, which helped make that company's decision to where maybe we don't want to move to Skagit County. Maybe we don't want to bring the 190 jobs that we had. And that's what I'm trying to, that's what I'm really trying to convey to you guys. There's no one single, you know, silver bullet for anything. Each thing is hooked to four or five different things. And then you got to go satisfy all of that. And sometimes you'll just find a hook and you go, okay, we can't satisfy that, so we can't do it. Go ahead. Well, I think there is an obvious solution to talking about all these problems. Just pave the entire runway with solar panels. <laughs> 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 that was a great idea. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, I was Very talking durable, to Mike Diver the other day. Uh -huh. and, uh, one thing led to another. He said, You're going to extend the runway? We are, yeah. Uh huh. Uh, within the next year or two? It's it's in the budget, I think, either for next year or the year after. Mm -hmm. What is it? He said 1,700 feet or something? 7,000, just a little over 7,000 feet. 7,200 feet, I think I don't have the number in my mind, but it's just over 7,000 feet. Uh huh. And the reason is to accommodate bigger aircraft? Yep, yep. Because I heard something about the fact that the runway we have now is not long enough for some of these jets that come in. That's correct. To get a full tank of fuel. Right. They can, they can land, right. they can take off, they can't, right. but they can't with a full tank of fuel. Right. Is that the reason for this? Yeah, so typically airplanes can land in shorter distances than they can take off in. How does that work? When you have a two-engine aircraft, you have, you know, the military... I understand that. Yeah, that. yeah, uh-huh. But the sole purpose is so they can get a full tank of fuel? No, the sole purpose is, is so that those type of airplane can come in here. That they actually will come in. The Gulf Streams will. Right. It's a Gulf Stream airplane that we're currently concerned about. Yeah, that'll have enough runway to come in here. Uh-huh. So they don't have enough runway now? They don't, no. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I, I thought it was just so that some of the aircraft that are coming in now cannot fill up their tanks full... So they leave uh, maybe three quarters full or something of that nature because they don't have enough runway. That's right. That's why we're an improvement. And we went to the FAA. This airport, whether you know it or not, is number five on the FAA's important list for uh, for airports. So this is a regional airport. That's our classification. We're number five in the nation. So it's a pretty that's a pretty high rating. So when we go to ask for things, we get a little extra edge. And yeah, so they cannot they can't leave with full fuel, full people. Uh, you know, some of the some of the the larger uh, jets. And so we want to have that capability. Seven three seven can land on seven thousand feet. Number five in what terms though? In terms of Regional in terms of the priority. Is this yeah. priority out? I can well, imagine we're number five in all the airports in the country. Well, you know, and, and I don't know all the details. <laughs> you know, like I say, as I've, as I've come along here, there are so many facets to this diamond. You know what I mean? There's just so what happens is apparently the FAA goes through every year and they prioritize all the commercial airports, they prioritize all that stuff. To, because the higher you are on the priority, the more likely you are to get money. And how they do that process, I don't know. So, but I do know that's, that. That's the curious part that we might investigate more. We're number yeah. five in what category and how can we right. leverage that? In regional. We're, we're a regional airport. So we're number five, and that was last year's number. I, maybe we've gone down this year. Maybe we've come up. I don't know. But it does make a difference as to the money, the priority that you get to the money that you can have. So. Anyway, how involved did uh, First Sketch get uh, in the search for a replacement for SeaTac? I know they're looking down south now, but uh, wasn't this named initially as possible? It, it was, yeah. And so, um, and then when they looked at the total details here, it couldn't happen. And so then what they proposed was to go down towards Conway, Stanwood, and that area down there. The county got involved in that, and uh, SCOG. So there's another group uh, called Skagit County Operations of Government. Anytime you have more than 50,000, this is what I say, there's just hooks and lines and <laughs> all this stuff. If you have more than 50,000 people, the state says, you have to have a coordination among all of the, the city entities, the county entities, and one of the entities is the port. So I sit on the, the, the SCOG. And so SCOG, we got together and we wrote a letter and we just said, we don't think Skagit County, the one thing we don't meet is the travel distance. We don't meet that travel distance that they wanted people to be able to come in here. And we just said, we're an agricultural community, we're trying to stay agricultural, and we just prefer to be taken off the list. It went one more round and we were taken off the list, so we're not on the list anymore. So that's how that happened. So anyway. And that is one thing that your government is doing for you. And so, uh, but it took a whole, 
I mean, every mayor is on that. Uh, several city council members, all the county commissioners, and the ports are all part of SCOG. To, it, it, we do all the roads. We approve all that, you know, because uh, people have concerns about roads. So they involve everybody. Because if you change Highway 20 here, it may affect Cedar Woolley, and they want to say in that. And so the state requires that. If you have over 50,000 people, the state requires you to have an organization like that. And there are employees at SCOG as well uh, that we pay to do that research for us. Helpful? <laughs> the other thing I learned is life is much more complicated than you would ever think. Me too. <laughs> oh, and so my last pit, I, I, you know, two other people that ran with me a couple years ago, they both have told me they are not running again. Uh, they don't want to. It's too complicated. It's, you know, and they just said, I, I just don't want it. And, you know, I felt like that a little bit myself. So... Make sure that you, when you approach your politicians and people that are standing in these gaps, that you're kind. You may not agree with them, but be kind. Because, you know, we, we have enemies on all sides, you know. I mean, it doesn't matter what position I take, somebody's going to hate it. You know what I mean? If I go down the gas, the, the you know, the, the greenies are going to hate it. And if I go down the greenie, deal, the gas people are going to hate it. And so we put up with all that a lot. I get Everywhere I go, I get involved in conversations with people. And they all have opinions, and I receive them, do I? I fully receive them, and I don't reject them. But at some point, i got to boil all that down and make a decision. Go ahead. Thanks for people like you that are willing to do the job you're doing. Okay, well, thank you, very much. well, thank you guys for, for helping me and helping me. I appreciate it. So, because it is tough. Yeah. You, so you see yourself as a commissioner as a political position as opposed to a service <laughs> position? I, I would not. I like to think it's not Peace. I'm with you on that. I do. I would not run for legislator or said I wouldn't run for any of those jobs. I wouldn't do. I don't think I would have the emotional capacity to do that. I, I, I get sometimes those little wiggles and jiggles that go on out here. I get a little bit like, well, you know, so anyway. You have to file whether you're an R or a D, don't you? Not with the port. No, no you don't. No. Okay. Right. It's, it's non. Yeah. It shouldn't be considered a political position. It's not. Yeah. We do the best that we can. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're trying really hard. Yeah. So. You get paid. I, you know what? That's a great question. I do get paid. So how much do I get paid? I get paid fifteen hundred a month. After I pay my health care, <laughs> because it comes with health care, um, and I have I'm retired military, so I have my health care. But but I have to do this right. And so then my checks are four hundred dollars on the fifteenth and on the first. So I get eight hundred a month, really in my pocket. That's what I get to to, to do. How this. much time do you put in? A lot. <laughs> Yeah, a lot. Yeah. Some of it's my own fault, though. I, I talk about these things a lot. It kind of makes me happy to talk about some of these things with people. And some people are tired of me talking about it with them, too. So anyway, yes, it all goes around. Yep. <laughs> all right. Awesome. Thanks, man. Okay, yep. Thank you, guys. I appreciate you. I do.